rich fabric of defining who we are as individuals and as a collective. My thoughts on this subject began when I had a student in my office who was sobbing uncontrollably because he was so sad. He didn't know why he was sad, he just was. McClendon and I had a long discussion with this gentleman about depression. We explained to him that sometimes we feel depressed and there's nothing that we can do about it. Other times the depression is situational and we can point to the exact cause. We break up with a significant other, a family member, or a friend is sick, dying, or perhaps has just died. For this particular student, there was no cause for his depression. He's a great student, has a great personality, he's fun-loving, has great friends, and everyone knows him as a happy-go-lucky person. Even his parents know him that way. After speaking with him for a while, he was feeling better, and he was even feeling hopeful. But this is where the story gets interesting. We joked with him a few minutes longer, and then as he was walking out the door, we explained that we would need to speak to his parents about this conversation. He fell back into a seat, and the sobbing resumed. He pleaded with us not to tell his mom. He wasn't worried about her not understanding his depression. He was worried that his mother would think that he was a complete fraud, because she knew him only as the happy-go-lucky child that everyone else knew him as. He was worried that she would find out that he had been lying to her his whole, this whole time, and that she would be mad at him for lying. There it was, the teaching that would consume my thoughts for the remainder of the school year. Let me break it down for you. I had already recognized that we can have multiple identities, 2016, right? What this young man did not realize, and what I actually had never thought about, was that we can also have multiple moods, even extreme happiness and extreme sadness that share a space in our psyche at exactly the same time. The question that I asked the student, and that I continue to ask myself, is it a lie to pretend that we're happy when we're sad? Is it a lie to pretend that we're sad when we're happy? Can we be both happy and sad at the same time? Just as with the multiple personalities that we all share, our state of mind, our condition, seems to be eternally fluid. When we look at ourselves and take stock of our mood, we have two choices. One, we can look at this particular instant in time and decide, am I happy right now? Or two, we can take an average of our mood across a longer period of time. Am I generally happy? I bet every one of us here at this graduation is both happy and sad at this very moment. We are all thrilled that our friends and family are here to see the celebration of achievement. But we are also sad that this event cannot last forever. We are sad that our loved ones will be leaving soon. As parents, we are sad that our children will be leaving, will be leaving the house. But we are happy that they achieved so much and are ready to take on the world. As children, we are happy that the torture of school, homework, late passes, rules, and curfews is finally over. But we are sad that we will be leaving <coughs> the comfort of home, and yes, admit it graduates, even the comfort of school. As educators, we are happy that we have succeeded in molding these fine young students into model citizens you see before you. But we are of course sad to see our friends move on to the next stage of their lives. So are we happy, or are we sad? Both. Was it a lie for that student to be sad, perhaps even depressed, and yet be smiley and happy and go lucky? Was he really lying to his mother? Of course not. He was happy and sad, just like all of us every day of our lives, every minute of our lives. In the last six weeks, I have felt every emotion possible, and I have felt those emotions intensely. The following is just a sampling of some of these emotions that I've felt. Actually though, let me jump all the way back to March 14th, the day of the National School Walkout. This was the day that confirmed for me the ideas that I'm sharing with you today. This day, originally, was going to be the anchor of my speech. Many of the students that are sitting before you today were instrumental in planning the Set Hive version of the walkout. It was a day of extreme sadness as we remembered what was then the most recent victim of school shootings, victims. I watched with pride as our students put together what I argue was the best school walkout there was. They kept politics out of it. They honored the memories of those children and adults who were torn away from us. I cried during that ceremony. I cried for the victims, but I also cried out of intense pride. I was feeling intense grief, intense hope, and intense joy all at the same time. Our students, these students, had achieved the perfect representation of our school. 
Let's jump forward to May 3rd. While watching the final boys volleyball game this year, I was so proud of the improvement that I saw in the play and teamwork of the students on the team. But at the same time, my heart was throbbing as I considered the very real possibility that, this, that we may not have a school next year because of the then private conflict that was arising between the staff and board. At that same event, I felt the excitement and the anticipation of the parents who talked to me, talked to me about plans for next year's sports teams and the succession plans for bowling and the incoming freshman families that were so eager to join us next year. I listened to the sickening of sadness, knowing all too well that those dreams may not happen. In the weeks that followed, I felt overwhelming pride for our staff as I saw them one by one stand up for the students of the school. At the same time, though, I felt fear for each of them, knowing that by standing, they each were putting their job on the line, and in many cases, their family income on the line. My heart warmed as I listened to them so eloquently make the case for why our education model works and so eloquently pleaded for their jobs. My heart sank when I saw each of them get battered and each of them reduced to trying to defend years and years of constant teaching, nurturing, and caring. I felt anger and outrage that their passion was on trial. I felt love and camaraderie like I've never felt before in a workplace as we slowly recognized that we were all sticking together that we believed in each other. At the same time, we feared surveillance. We were sure that we were being watched. Our words were measured. The hugs became stronger. To balance the feelings of impending doom, the laughter became louder. The smiles countered the depression that we were all feeling. The interweb of connections, 2013, was filling our lives with meaning. Simple things like the Mrs. Geis-inspired hand hug filled my days with hope. Let me teach it to you. Put your hands up. Turn to your neighbor. Put your hand on the neighbor's hand. And hug with your thumb. <laughs> it was our version of the Catanist three-fingered salute of the resistance in the Hunger Games. Together, things would be okay. During the same time, the students gradually became involved. I feared what the stress would do to them. I resisted the idea of them knowing that anything was amiss, but I could not argue their right to defend their teachers and their school. My heart again filled with pride as the students stood their ground, fought for what they believed in, fought for what was theirs. They stood up and roared like the lions they are. Students who just months ago were shy, quiet, and kept to themselves stood tall in front of a hundred strangers and spoke their truth. I was deeply saddened that they had to resort to this. The parents joined in and I was amazed at their ability to organize, to discover, and to prod for details. I wished that I could help them. I agonized that I didn't. The web of interconnections grew. The parents, students, and staff were all giving meaning to my life. 2013. My long-term selfishness of doing the right thing and making the right choices for the right reasons was paying dividends. 2014. We were all fighting to create the most perfect representations of ourselves and of the school. 2015. Boy, did we have multiple identities. 2016. I cried at home, stood strong at school, was stoic when I needed to be, and laughed and hugged when I needed to feel the support from the community. Together, we risked failure. Big time. 2017. We were happy, and we were sad at the same time. Were we lying when we were happy? No. Were we lying when we were sad? No. I will intentionally leave out the emotions that were going through my mind on the evening that I was fired and hired in the span of a few minutes. I think you can imagine that I felt them all. I wish I could say the name of the student who taught me this year's lesson. I would love to give him credit for the wisdom he imparted to me. I wish that I could give each of the students credit for all that they teach me. How lucky I am to be in this job. Oh wait, am I in this job? <laughs> How lucky I am to be taught such profound things from some of the most caring, perceptive, probing, thoughtful and inquisitive people you can imagine. Class of 2018, 
You have been taught so well. You have taught me so well. I expect such amazing things from you. I urge you to be the perfect representations of yourselves. I urge you to take this bond that you share with your peers and teachers who love you so much and let those inner connections fill your lives with meaning. I urge you to accept your multiple personalities. You're never going to find your one true identity. I urge you to risk and fail so that you can become stronger. And most importantly, I urge you to let your emotions flow in whatever crazy ways they decide to emerge. It's okay to cry, laugh, and smile at the same time. Class of 2018, thank you. We are now going to honor uh, those graduates who have demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to community service. All graduates in the state of California are required to complete 15 hours of community service. Our graduates complete many more. Today we will recognize those students who have demonstrated a commitment to service. Each of them has completed more than 150 hours of community service during their high school years. Graduates, uh, please come up as I call your name. Christopher Anguiano. <laughs> Jesse Bowers. Randall Brenner. Daniel Carpenter. Sean Michael Castillo. Ryan Conover. Grace Engelman. Christian Jimenez. Kendall Lack. Giselle Lopez. Evan Luckett. Jalen Lundy, Anthony Mason, Kevin Meehan, Kayla Moreno, Thomas Muir, Blanca Ramirez, Destiny Robbins, Justin Smart, Vincent Smith, Chloe Sobolewski, Sobolewski, sorry. Um, Parker Templin, Avery Tenwald, Kathleen Terwilliger, Alex Wary, and Haley Williams. So we have eight additional red cords that I would like to give out today. These are honorary red cords for some in our community who have easily reached 150 hours of community service through the support of the school. Can I have the following parents please come to the stage? Ms. Catherine Carpenter, Ms. Muir, Mr. Scott Shelton, Ms. Lisa Angiano. No, I was just told that I said it wrong for some. <laughs> uh, Mr. Anderson Brown, Mr. 
Mr. and Mrs. Hempton, Mr. Bowers, and Mr. and Mrs. Fido. Ms. Carpenter and Ms. Muir are being honored for their work with Cyber Patriots. Mr. Sheldon is being honored for his work with the robotics teams. Ms. Anguiano and Mr. Brown are being honored for their work, their extraordinary work uh, efforts on the board. I think they put in far more than 150 hours of community service just in the last two weeks. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Templin are being honored for founding Set High Bowling. Mr. Bowers for his photographs and work on the website. And Mr. and Mrs. Fidel for their extremely generous financial support throughout their time at Set High. I would also like to issue a collective red cord to all the families who have been so generous in your time and support over the past few weeks.